Welcome to FACT's webinar called Water Management for Pasture Grazing Systems. Our presenter today is Steve Gabriel with Wellspring Forest Farm. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. So I'm really glad that you could all join us. So just um, <laughs> a minute or two for some quick introductions before we dive right into the presentation. Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT, we are a uh, national nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Illinois and we, um, we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. And we work to accomplish this by supporting humane farmers such as yourselves, promoting uh, policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and then also helping consumers make informed food choices. So I am the director of our humane farming program, which is really probably the best job in the one of the best jobs in the world, besides perhaps being a farmer, because I get to work with farmers all across the country and um, um, offer a variety of services, um, including we have conference scholarships, we have customized handouts, we have um, a annual grant pr making program, a mentorship program, and of course, a series of free webinars on fascinating topics. So I invite you to visit our website to learn all about our farmer services. Awesome, so at this time I'm pleased to introduce our our esteemed presenter, uh, Steve Gabriel. Steve is an agroforestry extension specialist with the Cornell um, Small Farms Program, and he's also managing editor of Small Farms Quarterly. Along with his wife, Liz, Steve operates Wellspring Forest Farm and School in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Um, and as you might recall, Steve was with us uh, last fall for a series of webinars um, about silvopasture. So we're really lucky to have him back with us today um, to talk about pasture water management. So I think um, without further ado, Steve, I'm going to turn this floor over to you so that you can get started. Okay, can, can, oh, can there you hear me all right? There you go, yep. Okay, great. Let me just share my screen. Good afternoon, everybody, assuming you're in an afternoon part of the world, but um, I think most folks are in that region. So glad to be here with you and uh, to share a bit about water. Um, I'm going to this afternoon present sort of an overview and focus on um, water management in the landscape. Um, there were some questions that came in on the registration around uh, water systems and, you know, uh, <laughs> plumbing fittings and things like that. And um, we're going to focus more on the landscape scale, but maybe we can think about a future program if that makes sense. There's a lot with water, of course, to get into. And for me, I'll say, um, having worked with grazing systems for a while and and specifically focused on silvopasture, I think water is something that we often um, forget about or we focus on, I want to get these cool silvopasture systems going or these grazing systems going, and I'll just sort of deal with the water dynamics. And they can really pop up on us, especially as we go through lots of changes with how the hydrological cycle is responding to, to the changing climate. So I'm going to share some overview, some resources for you to get started wherever you may be at, and some some stories from our farm this afternoon, and then we can we can answer some questions and take it from there. Um, and I'll share a bit about our work as well as we go through. So I always like to start and just uh, mention that we're broadcasting um, today from unceded Gaiokono lands. That's the Cayuga people part of the Six Nations Haudenosaunee. And for us, my wife and I, as um, farmers and um, landowners, we like to um, reflect and think deeply about the troubled history of um, indigenous land and theft and, and our role in that and what we can do to, to support um, sovereignty of these nations um, and, and what we can do in our work, both on the farm and in our, in our daily lives to address um, some of the inequalities that we see affecting these people. So we acknowledge that we are on this land and um, farming this land and in a relationship with these folks and learning and growing and, and looking to support their sovereignty and their work um, as we farm and, and teach and do the things that we do. And if you're um, unfamiliar with whose land you might find yourself in, um, there's a great resource, nativeland.ca, um, that, that is 
a beautiful map that's growing every month that I look at it. <laughs> so it used to be just what we know as the U.S. now. It's expanded much into Canada. Now it's going into South America and, and globally. So it's a really cool resource to check out um, indigenous history of where you might find yourself living or working or traveling to. So our, our farm really grounds itself in the landscape and in wanting to reconnect and um, and farm in a way that restores and um, creates a, a beneficial ecosystem, not just for us and our animals and the things that we like to grow, but also for for nature as a whole, for the, for the wildlife, uh, for the soil, for the future, for the next generation. So we really think deeply about the different systems and the different ways that we engage um, and the different scales that we, we um, operate these different systems. And we call ourselves a forest farm because really our vision is to farm in the image of a forest. So where there is existing forest, we try to steward that um, as healthy forest for the future. And we hope that where there is not forest, there will be forest someday. So planting trees and reforesting a lot of our landscape. And so agroforestry is a natural fit for us um, as a way to think about this in a framework. Um, and water is really just one of those layers of the onion that we look at uh, when we think about the complex layers of managing an ecosystem and stewarding an ecosystem over time. So we produce a lot of different things and some have come and some have gone and some may show up in the future um, as we as we learn and, and grow in our landscape. And, so trees and grazing and um, working with animals has been a really important part. We stored about 50 acres, and I don't know of any other system that can radically transform the health of the landscape in quite the way that a rotational grazing system can. So the animals are out there 24-7 um, doing the work, and if we're doing our work, we're getting them to the right place at the right time. We're moving them to a new place and letting that paddock they were just in um, rest and and finding the balance there between those systems. And what we see are some really positive results, uh, both around water, um, and I'll talk about those a little bit as we go, and also um, around soil health and organic matter and things like that. So our farm kind of looks like this is our grazing plan here with different paddocks, the red paddocks being our main grazing uh, season. The blue paddocks being our winter paddocks for um, for keeping the sheep. They're hanging out in there, waiting for grass to grow, and they'll get back out to pasture. And then green areas we've really identified as major conservation areas and are working with NRCS and other partners to, to really focus on those um, as important ecosystem functions, um, which have limited agricultural use then in that way, but not, not entirely excluded. Um, we're going to focus this afternoon just on um, a slight a sort of a section of the land because we've done a lot of our water work really on the land that we um, hold title to and have long-term ownership the rest of the uh, essentially the map that you see here is leased land and so we're in conversation with the landowners about what it could look like but honestly it's taken us 10 years and we're still working on some of the hydrology um, on this part of the land and it's certainly the the part that has the largest impact um, so we came to a piece of land that we found um, with uh, heavily sort of degraded soils, compacted soils, where after just a minor rain event, water would pool and sit and not infiltrate into the soil, where nutrients were very deficient in the soil and organic matter was pretty low, um, in some places under 4%, um, and in some places are right around 4%. We're seeing organic matter, by the way, 10 years later, around 5 to 6%, depending on where we're at. So we're, we're already seeing an increase um, over the time that we've been here. But water was really a unifying feature in, in our landscape with our heavy clay soils, um, water will show up and then have a hard time necessarily getting into the soils. And so there's a lot of runoff issues. And then the way that land has been farmed, especially with heavy machinery and um, not really paying attention to how water wants to flow, I think would, is one way I'd summarize it. Um, we, we encountered a lot of challenges early on. And so we'll share some of the ways that we've solved those problems and thought about them creatively as, as a resource, really. And that's where I wanna start with when we think about water. Um, I often hear people um, that I work with in classes and consulting and other ways talk about water as sort of a pain in the, pain in the butt, <laughs> especially in cooler climates where we have been used to pretty good amounts of rain and pretty even distribution throughout the season. I think we, we sometimes take it for granted. And um, so when things flood, when things erode, when, um, when we have problems, um, we often think of, see those and we don't think about all the benefits water bring to our landscapes day in and day out. But if we're going to solve and, and uh, provide a good way for water to be in the land, uh, we have to think of it as an asset. We think of it as a valuable resource that we want to um, channel and support in a way that it sort of is, 
is in line with the natural properties of water, what water wants to do, so to speak, and also that aligns with the ways that we're using the landscape. So for instance, letting streams flow, but also making sure they don't flow through the major areas where we might have infrastructure, buildings, um, where we might be driving vehicles a lot that are really prone to erosion and don't benefit from um, from that interaction with water or flooding. And, and that can be a real um, mental uh, uh, activity, uh, you know, uh, that hits the farm bottom line. So of course, there's a lot of uh, instances on the farm where we just have kind of spots where we see water showing up. And even in dry times or in moderately wet times, we might have these kind of puddling areas. But what I want to do today is really focus on the bigger picture and talk about some of the larger scale impacts and encourage you to always think about if you see something going on with water in your farm landscape, that there's a bigger story happening. And that larger story is within the watershed. And it may be on the site that you are taking care of and stewarding. It may be beyond that. It may be the next door neighbor or it may be the entire watershed flowing uphill. So we find ourselves situated at the top of a major watershed. You can see here the horizon there at the top. If you were to go up to that horizon, um, south of our farm, you would hit the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed that flows south uh, towards Washington, D.C. Our land all flows north and eventually ends up um, in the St. Lawrence Riverway up uh, between Canada and New York. And so um, that's one level we can operate on, but then we can kind of drill deeper down and we need to kind of constantly be thinking about the micro scale and the macro scale and zooming in and out. So example here of challenge is we see a lot of water coming into our site from offsite and we only have so much that we can do but by the time it reaches our site, it's pretty dramatic. This is a, a same shot of that um, overview map where we have a gullied area that is a seasonal stream. It sort of responds to large fluctuations um, in precipitation. So sometimes it's dry and sometimes it's very um, rapidly flowing. But you can see it's gullied away uh, a lot of our, um, our edge here. And, and in some places you stand into it and it's four feet deep. Um, and that's really because if we walk upstream, we find that all the ditches from the road, the roads themselves, other people's property, a lot of people just dump water straight into this. And so by the time it gets down to us, it's too hard to really manage it meaningfully um, because it, the water intensity can be too much. The volume can be too much. So we're going to do our best to improve this and um, make it a more viable uh, riparian area, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it certainly is challenging sometimes sort of downstream because of that velocity and volume. So keep that in mind. And it's important to think about. And if you're not familiar with your site, it's a great activity um, with family or on a weekend to walk up your watershed and see where the water is coming from and all the different factors that are contributing to the, the effects you see downstream. Now, of course, on a very, um, very extreme sort of scenario, this is in Vermont a few years ago when we had, they had some major flooding from um, hurricane rains, related rains. And um, of course, we're seeing an increase in these types of events. So um, especially in the Northeast US, but um, to a, a good point in the Midwest and many of the cool temperate regions um, up into Canada, we're seeing an overall increase in precipitation. Um, we're seeing when rain comes, it's not coming in smaller events, it's usually coming in larger events. And then we're often seeing after that sometimes long periodic dry spells at the same time. So this sort of light and even uh, distribution of water is certainly uh, not the norm, I would say. And I think we're just going to see extremes start to show up. So we have to question with our, our design, what are we designing for? We're probably designing for um, the normal sort of events, the low level events, what we think of as normal anyway, at this point. Um, we're designing for, you know, the, that two or three inch rain event and what impact that can have. And then we're designing potentially for this type of rain event. Um, where we are in our farm, we're really not in the path of a lot of, um, so far, a lot of hurricane systems. And so this type of rainfall is not something that we're expecting in our lifetime, but it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. And so we think about these things um, as we design our water systems, how to handle these different levels of capacity. Um, and that can be a, check, a, a challenge, but it's important to think about these multiple scales all at once. So I really want to recommend a resource to read up on and dig into. And, and Brad Lancaster has a lot of um, written material. It's free on his website. He has a wonderful book here that I've highlighted. Um, also a lot of podcasts. He just shows up all over the place. And really, really, I think, frames water harvesting, again, in that kind of positive, proactive way. He's coming from a dryland climate, um, Arizona. And so in those climates, it's very easy to sort of design everything to capture the most amount of water possible. So key to think in mind if you're not in that type of climate is 
Um, you may need to do that, but also plan on those overflow events, or in some cases, plan water um, mechanisms that, that shed water away from certain things, because we may not be able to handle the capacity of what's coming at us. But I think these principles are really great to start at um, and to think about and, and to keep referring back to as we think about water planning. Um, so we'll talk about a few of these as we go. Um, I, met, I put sometimes because slowing and spreading and infiltrating the flow of water is, is definitely our overall goal, but there's definitely, we found on our farm points and, and situations where that doesn't work. We can definitely slow it and spread it, but we don't always have the time to infiltrate it. Sometimes we need it to move to somewhere else as well. So a picture from his um, book here, just to illustrate what we're trying to do is think about starting at the top of our watershed, which could be the roofs on the building that we live in or use on our farm, we're harvesting and cycling and moving water through as many different um, mechanisms as possible. And there's really not one solution. I think a lot of people I've worked with think of, oh, I'm gonna dig a pond and that'll be my solution. But a pond is really just one element in a sequence of water harvesting features that combined together can increase the capacity of your site to har harvest water. It can passively irrigate plantings and things like that. And you can move water from areas where it might be a little bit too much to areas where you might want to see a little bit more water distribution. And when we think about pasture, often what we're trying to do is strike that balance. So how do we start to shift some of the dynamics when we see, you know, those soggy pastures that only dry out once once a year or in those really drought, droughty years? Can we can we create a more balanced water dynamic and therefore create a more productive pasture at the same time? So a first key thing to do is think really simply and do some, I think uh, I like to do some drawing um, and mapping and walking of the, of the site. And so we start with this concept where we identify what sources of water are coming on to the spaces that we're stewarding and then what sinks, where the water's leaving. And what we want to go, what we want to do is from the source of any water, we want to slow that water down and think about as many different creative ways we can utilize it and let it, um, let it slow down. When, when it slows down, it's going to drop sediment, so we're not going to have an erosive effect. Um, let it spill over into new things and trickle its way down through the site. And then before it leaves, when it's a sink, hopefully we're not just sticking a tailpipe out the end of our property onto our neighbor's property, right? Um, a lot of times a drain tile just empties into someone else's ditch and it's someone else's problems. But for us, ultimately, our water all flows downhill, of course. It hits the Taganok Creek watershed and goes over Taganok Falls, which is one of the major features of our area and is where a, a significant portion of our watershed drains. And this waterfall is something I visit and think about. The impact and the ways that we manage water on our farm impact this waterfall eventually. And I want that water to leave cleaner and without sediment and um, and hopefully the slow pace from our site. And if I'm doing that, then I know I'm on the right track. Contours are gonna be really important in water management. Um, getting familiar with how to read contour and understand what, it's, what they're telling you. And also ground truthing, because um, not all contour maps are perfectly accurate. I put a link down at the bottom for a really simple way to get some pretty nice contour maps. Um, these folks have a permaculture oriented um, design and education business, I believe based in Canada, but I might be wrong about that. And they have a wonderful contour map generator where they've utilized data sources and it becomes really easy for you to um, to look up your property and download contour maps and choose different intervals for how you might wanna um, look at the different levels of data. And um, I think it's about 20 bucks to, to utilize it for, for like a week or something. Um, and you can download all the maps you want in that time and then and then utilize them. And here we're utilizing this contour map in Google Earth, which also allows you to pan around and look at some of the different dynamics. If you're not familiar with contour, just briefly, you know what we're looking at are lines that are that are connecting points of equal elevation on your site. And it's important to kind of consider when you see a circle of those lines. What does that mean? It means a peak or or the top of a knoll or something like that. And when we see lines pointing sort of upward or, or versus downward on the site. So when lines are sort of pointing upslope, then that's indicating low elevation or, or valleys. And when they're pointing down, that's usually indicating ridges and things like that. So the quicker you can get familiar and read, the, the better you can really have a good um, sense of what's going on just by looking at the map and um, without looking at the slope. But the nice thing again about Google Earth is you can actually look around and dig in and kind of pan around and get a sense of your landscape without having to necessarily visit all points. 
And I'll say too, um, I have a number of tutorials on how to get started in Google Earth, including how to load these maps on our website, silvapasturebook.com. So there's a four part video series where you can learn how to use Google Earth. On the site, a lot of tools that we utilize. Most commonly, we utilize two things, an A-frame and a laser level. And these are tools that help us find points of equal elevation on the site. So if we're going to plot out a swale, whether that's a small scale one behind our house that's going to harvest the water coming from our foundation drain, uh, uh, that's what we use the A-frame for, you know, kind of small scale hand, hand scale. Or a laser level when we're digging larger swales or ditches or things across a landscape. And a laser level usually can range from 500 to 800 feet, and you can get readings and, and mark contour on the land. So we might do some design and some thinking on the maps, and then we do the work on the ground when we're actually digging stuff <laughs> and moving earth. So here we are at the top of our watershed, as I mentioned before. Um, you can see we're really all draining kind of downhill towards the, that, that kind of long, slender lake. That's Cuga Lake. Um, and like I said, just behind us, it's a whole nother watershed draining in a completely opposite direction here. You could find maps, hyd hydrological maps, and get a sense of your watershed online. And again, this was something I loaded into Google Earth um, as a way to look at that. But I think probably what's most important is actually to work within your own site and define what we might call micro watersheds. And so a watershed is any uh, collection of your, any sort of portion of your land, any, any bubble or box of your land, where all the water that falls on that landscape is going to drain in the same direction. And um, in most cases, a watershed would include two portions of, you know, what drains from one side and what drains from the other side. So if you look at the bottom left corner of this image, you have the orange blob and you have the red blob. Those are actually both part of the same watershed. And they're both draining down there. And actually, the blue, the blue blob there, too, is also part of that watershed. Um, it's just a bit funky because of our property line. So that's really all one watershed. But I delineate them differently because I'm going to think about what each kind of um, micro watershed or which each part of the watershed, what it offers, what challenges, what unique situations, what vegetation is there, what microclimates it presents, what water is actually doing there is very different in all of those little, those little pieces. So getting out and sort of just figuring out, okay, what are the chunks of land that all flow in one direction and, and what does that look like? How steep is it? How intense is it? Those, those sort of colored blocks I just mentioned are actually the areas that are most intense on the land. And as we move into some of the green and purple areas, it's pretty subtle, but it's still there. There's a lot of water flow and movement, and we've had to really observe over time to get a sense of where those boundaries are and also what are some of the, the kind of micro things that are happening. And so good water management really, I think, is based in a lot of observation, a lot of walking around. And honestly, the best time to do that is during a downpour. <laughs> You get on your, your muck boots, you put a raincoat on, or you get an umbrella, and you walk out um, and watch the water and where it's flowing and what it's doing. That's that's the way I've learned the most about how to design these systems. So you can see here, I mentioned identifying sources and sinks. I, I marked the sources of this site in the kind of um, bluish pins in the sinks, the major sinks in the pink. So in this case, we really have two endpoints. We have a large pond that we partially share with our neighbors. Um, that's actually a major watershed feature. So there's actually some restrictions, ideally, about what's supposed to go in there. Um, and then we also have this this um, creek that kind of runs off the bottom corner of the property there. And so there's a lot of ways that water sort of wants to get to those points and um, and causes a lot of mischief along the way and also causes a lot of benefit. Um, so you can see a mix here of some of the natural flows of water and, and some of the things we've installed, like this funky little swirl here in the middle of our pasture is a swale system that instead of the water going right down the hill and into that creek, it's actually forced to take a very long, almost 500 foot circuitous route across the contour. Um, and we found in, in heavy rain events, these, these swales will fill up and, and do quite a bit to hydrate our pastures without causing erosion. Um, the light blue blobs here are kind of wetland areas or vernal areas that water um, levels sort of ebb and flow. And then we have a small pond right by the house there that we dug as well as part of our, our management strategy. So you find those things, you identify the sources and sinks, do, do some drawing and some mapping, and then um, figure out those areas that feel like they're, they're most worth your time because you're not going to be able to do everything. That's the reality. Um, and so we um, identify these areas and then figure out how we want to remediate them and, and what ways we can support that. Is that part of our livestock budget because it's going to increase pasture productivity? Is it a NRCS project that we can get funding for? Is it something that we just want to do and so we'll pick away at it over time? Or 
Um, in one case here, there's there's a blob on the driveway, and if we didn't fix that, we wouldn't be able to drive up and park our house, uh, park in front of our house. Um, and when we started on this land, we actually had to park at the corner and sort of walk up the muddy driveway um, because of some major water issues. So you kind of prioritize those things and figure it out and, and knock things off, you know, in sequence as you can. So we're going to talk about kind of water harvesting and different methods and, and practices and what we found to be really effective. And um, we're going to start kind of at the easiest, the cheapest, um, and the simplest ways to do that. And so we could start by um, highlighting uh, just vegetation and mulch as a major way to harvest and slow and store water. And some plants and some mulches and some systems do better than others. Um, this is a slide from Prince Edward Island in Canada. And it was a farm I visited as a potato farm where this is a buffer planted between the farm fields and the, the bay. Um, if you're familiar with Prince Edward Island mussels, it's a big industry there. And this uh, vegetation system is essentially harvesting runoff and also fertilizer because potatoes, um, in this case, uh, conventional potatoes have a lot of uh, phosphate and nitrate runoff. And so these were actually, um, the, the, the farmer was paid to, to plant these and um, and the university we're doing was studying the, the uptake of water and nutrients. And um, willow can respond incredibly well to all those things and will grow. This, this willow was growing about 150 times what it would sort of naturally grow um, because it was allocating so much nitrogen, phosphorus, and water to its growth. And what was really cool about this system was the farmer was then harvesting this material and using it for biomass to generate electricity for the farm. So taking all that, what could have been a problem, and turning it into a, an energy source was, I thought, really brilliant. On our farm, we do similar things. We plant willow buffers, but instead of using them for energy generation, what we do is we feed them to the sheep as a, as a tree fodder. And if you haven't seen, I did a tree fodder webinar in the past for fact. And so we can harvest water and think of it as something that's going into a product that actually um, increases uh, the resiliency of our other systems. So this may not be anywhere near your pasture. This might be on an edge where you have an erosive issue. It can be really simple to plant willow in this way. And then you have a product you can bring back to your, your grazing animals that bring um, a lot of sort of medicinal benefits. So willow is very high in tannin, which will um, support gut health and reduce parasite um, prevalence in the rumen um, in particular, and also um, reduce methane output from grazing grazing animals. There's research to back up all those things. So, um, so just an example here of how that can be a powerful thing in and of itself, and these can be very inexpensive and they don't really require earth moving or anything like that to get going. Likewise, you know, the next step could be rainwater catchment. This is a very um, cost effective way to, to create more water for the site and potentially reduce issues. Because I find when I visit sites, a lot of the water issues come from around roofs because roofs are impermeable surfaces that harvest a lot of water. And when they're not carefully designed, that water goes everywhere. It can either go down the downspout and cause problems there or it just flies off the edge of the roof. And um, in large rain events, that can really cause a lot of significant issues. So rainwater catchment systems can be great, and you can um, design ones that actually are um, entirely potable, um, meaning you could drink the water if you needed to. So think about um, resiliency in terms of if the electricity grows out or if your well isn't working or something like that. We lived off rainwater for about the first five years that we were on the site. Key things are to um, understand a bit about the pH of your water, to have what's called a first flush system. You can see on the left there where the first uh, amount of water washing off the roof goes into that small barrel and then it backfills and then there's actually a little ball in that pipe that pushes up and then allows the water to spill into the tank. Keeping a very clean tank, um, actually painting it or covering it uh, would be key here because algae can grow if you have light exposure. So there's a lot of different factors if you want to make it potable, but it's actually a very feasible thing to do. Um, and it's even nice to keep your water pretty clean if you're going to use it for other things because then it just means you have to clean your tanks a lot less. Um, and we've moved towards this kind of system where we had you know, ample water showing up. We might hook up a little RV pump or something if we wanted a little bit of pressure. And we were running our farm for the first uh, six years off basically rainwater. Um, and that's great. The, the challenge with rainwater is, of course, if it's a drought year, you don't have a lot of supply. Um, and what we do now is we actually wheel a cart underneath our gutter and just load it up. And that cart, then we drive out to the field with the tractor. And that's how we feed our sheep uh, or feed. We water our sheep um, in, in paddocks where they don't have a lot of water access. So 
it's just an IBC cube tank here, you know, on a cart, sitting under the gutter. Once it's full, it goes out to pasture, and then we have another one that we put to fill the next time, and um, and it works pretty well. So that can be a great way to to work with water as well. And none of those things require again moving earth and getting into some of the more complex design. But ultimately, these kind of systems that do require earth moving and, and some more deep thought um, have a much wider impact. They really can affect the hydrology of the site. And I think a key thing to think about is that um, hydrology has been ignored on our, many of our farms. And so um, water is trying to sort of make its way back into a natural state and often is creating problems because it's running up against compacted soil, against um, um, you know old gullies, against sort of um, the, the, the traditional way, you know, we've always been trying to just put all of our water down into the ditch. <laughs> so a lot of problems come from just so much volume, as I mentioned in that first example. So swales are really the antithesis to a ditch. If a ditch is where I try to spit everything into one space and get it downhill and get it away from the site, a swale is saying, no, I want to actually turn that ditch on its side and make it as long as possible and harvest as much water as I can. And the goal really is to spread it out. Um, so if you imagine a, a ditch running along contour for many feet, there's going to be points in that, let's say, 500-foot span where water is concentrated and parts where it is, it is more diffuse. And what a swale does is it evens it out. So if that swale is dead level, wherever that water enters, it's going to seek its own level throughout that entire swale, whether that's an inch deep or a foot deep, depending on the volume. And so you can design these systems to harvest that, spread that water out, and that can be really beneficial. Swale systems tend to make really great planting systems as well. So again, another connection to pasture and silvopasture. Great place, great place to create a berm that essentially is a great place to plant trees. Um, some of our best trees have grown on, on the swales that we've put into the ground. So here's an example on a small scale at a student farm at Cornell that we, we did some swales on this really steep slope, planting a, a number of different um, perennial trees. This is just with a BCS walk behind um, with a rotary plow attachment on it. And pretty simple to do, really uh, address some of the, again, kind of when you see those single gullies of water erosion happening, these these swales in, in being installed, and they're pretty subtle, um, really did a lot to, to remove and reduce that impact on this, on this steeper slope. And of course, if I was going to do this for a grazing system, they weren't grazing in between, I would do much wider rows. This is a bit narrow. This is probably about 15 or 20 feet between rows. And we found that the minimum for, for like sheep would probably want to do at least 50 or 60 rows to, to have nice laneways for grazing. But just to give you a sense, this can happen on a really sort of smaller scale. Um, we could do this by hand, but of course machinery really helps make it go much quicker. Um, when we first moved to our farm, uh, we lived in the yurt there on the top. <coughs> and we were, um, Again, harvesting a lot of water. There's a lot of water running off the site. So we oriented our first beds that we were planting. These are mostly just um, bare soil with cover crop at this point, very early on in our um, planting here. And we did the paths along contour, and these effectively became swales, which in the initial time, after a small rain event, we found a lot of water in these pathways. Now, I haven't seen water in these pathways um, in uh, probably eight or eight or nine years. And that's because the vegetation, the mulch, the organic matter, we've built up a lot of um, water holding capacity in these beds. And so we really don't see standing water anymore, right? So things change over time. As your soil increases its capacity, so does the ability for it to harvest water. Here's a larger swale that we dug, um, that squiggle I showed you on the map before, where we used an excavator. We rented an excavator. It's um, Something I like to do, uh, you, if you if you try to find a contractor, they might look at you funny when you say, I want to dig a ditch across the slope. <laughs> but you might find someone really curious and interested in it as well. Um, and the proof's in the pudding. Once you see its effect on, on, a, on a large rain event, I think people start to get it. But it's just a bit different because contractors are used to draining water away from things. And here I am bringing water through my, my site. Um, so you can see the line here at the bottom. We would we'd use the laser level to site that contour, spray paint the line, and then dig where the, the, the basin is up to that line, and then the berm is um, downslope from that. And again, that berm becomes a wonderful place to plant. And now this is completely integrated with our pasture. So we have willow planted on this, and our sheep graze right over the mound. Um, and it actually creates a nice little microclimate for them, um, a bit of a sheltered area from the wind, things like that. So lots of benefits to adding these to the, to the site.
Um, after the hand digging, there's definitely some hand work that needs to be done to smooth it out, make sure that it's at the right grade. And this swale system is actually a bit off contour. Um, so it slopes about an inch every 50 feet. So we did want to have some drainage. And um, and that's a factor that like Brad's book, the, the water harvesting book I mentioned goes into. So in some cases you want to be dead level. In some cases you might want to have a, a slight slope depending on the content of your soil essentially and where you want the water to move. Um, what you want to avoid is where the, the swale fills up completely and then doesn't have anywhere to go. So one of those principles that's really key is that there's always an overflow. Where does it go and how does it become a resource for something else? That's a really important factor to think about. So the swale is part of a, another swale, it's part of a pond, right? And eventually that is then a part of the, the creek. But by the time that water gets to the creek, it's so slowed down, there's no sediment in it, and it's it's not creating a negative impact on that creek at the bottom of the hill. Here it is after a three inch rain event, pretty much at full capacity. Um, and we're getting these more and more. Like I say, a couple on a rainy season, we, last year was very dry for us, but on a rainy season, we'll see at least one to three of these types of rain events. And I, I like to walk out here, see this, and then realize that this is the amount of water that could have been running down our pastures, saturating them. Um, instead, it's allowed to slowly infiltrate down into the soil and actually benefit the pasture growth um, over time. Another shot of the swales, you can see here again, some of the tree planting that we did on them as well. So this creates a really nice elevated space, especially in heavy clay soils. You can get your trees established and they're not sitting in that water. Um, and um, you can do a lot of good cover cropping and get sort of a healthier soil mix. And, and trees do sometimes a lot better um, in that raised environment. So it's a nice balanced system. I think it's very worth the investment. And in the winter, same thing. Here's the willow swale. Acts as a bit of a windbreak and, um, and a snowbreak as well. Um, we haven't done a lot of these. I just want to mention, though, that some people um, often look at different systems and um, and don't want to do a full swale system, but you can do these on a smaller scale and you can do these little catchments. And sometimes we see them showing up around just individual trees. This is a system that actually is very common. It's an indigenous agriculture system that we see a lot in dryland climates where we want to collect not just water, but nutrients and materials that might be flowing through the site in a very limited basis. So um, you can look these up. They're called boomerang berms or sometimes net and pan, where you kind of create these little micro swales around plantings. And that can be really beneficial for spreading water out again and creating that. We haven't really done that on our site, but I do know a friend up the road who um, planted his trees and, and gave each one a bit of a burn because um, it was a very steep slope and had good success, like not really needing to water them um, or worry about them. They did really well in that kind of system. So I just mentioned that as another option. Um, ditches and drains, uh, just a couple pictures here. Um, there's definitely areas of the farm where we have to think about getting water away. And one one thing I want to mention really quickly is um, while swales are great, they would be totally inappropriate on areas of the farm where we have a lot of infrastructure. Uh, in those areas, what we want to do is drain water, get it away, and not let it sit for too long. And um, unfortunately, in our building design, we made an error here with we have the, the greenhouse roof, uh, the high tunnel, I should say, here on the left. Um, sloping down and then we have the roof from the the barn um, sloping and so we create we create this nice little area in the middle that um, collects a lot of rain and collects a lot of snow um, and it's luckily it's only about 25 feet long and I can shuffle it out pretty quick but um, it's it's not the best idea so think about where your roof shed and I wish I had given myself a wide enough alley here to uh, to get the tractor and the plow through right because I guess it's good for me exercise wise but these kind of scenarios, um, you know, we were aware of this. We were, it was sort of a, a necessary part of the site uh, design. But um, in this case, this whole area from sort of the top of the screen here where, the, where you can see us going out away from these buildings down to below where I'm standing, there's a, there's a drain tile. And we backfilled this with uh, pervious material. And so what's good is that whenever th there's a rain event um, or, or heavy snow and it does melt, it never, there's never standing water and there's never mud here. So it's draining away very consistently. We get that away from the buildings and then it goes to an infiltration spot where it's, it's soil based and it can settle out any um, erosion and then work its way into the ditch and eventually into the pond below. But drains and, and things like this certainly have their value. Um, our house foundation, this is originally the standpipe from the gutter went down into a foundation drain, which popped out uh, onto the yard. That's really common with a lot of houses. They just kind of like get it away from the house, which is great, but then it makes a big mess in the yard because it's just sort of spilling out into that. 
So what we did is we put a, an option here to have a valve and, and reroute this. So this actually reroutes right to the small pond in front of our house, really simple kind of plumbing job. But it also gives us the flexibility if the pond is full or we don't want the water to go that way for it to go back down into the foundation drain. So a lot of spaces, sometimes you can retrofit to have the option ability to harvest or to sort of let it pass by. And that's a really important thing when you're thinking about plumbing for water. And here's the swale that we dug uh, pretty much by hand, this one. This is where the, um, at the at the bottom of the screen is where that foundation drain was just spitting out. And I swear within the first month after our house was built, it was just a gully. It was just already starting to gully right down slope here. So we dug this small swale. It harvest any of that extra water, it lets it soak into, and then it's a nice planting berm for these poplars, which eventually will be uh, another windbreak feature for the land and another fodder source for our sheep and things like that. So for us, it's always, you know, earth moving, water harvesting, planting with both cover crops and trees. And then we have our, our nice balance um, with our pasture there. So it, it it's also helped um, moderate. So you can see the swales about maybe 50 or 60 feet the hydrology in this pasture used to be really poor, like very wet here on the left side and very dry on the right side. And we find now the, the, the moisture to be much more evened out, which is nice um, and, and works well. Very passive system. I think the thing that people always think about when they think about water is ponds. And every site I've gone to, every folks I support, they're like, oh, I want a pond. I definitely want a pond. Where can I put a pond? <laughs> and I, what I would say with ponds is they can be great. But again, they're part of a larger system. OK, so a pond needs to start with water flowing in at a slow rate and it needs to leave at a slow rate and and again be another opportunity to spread water out on your on your farm landscape. So it's not the only solution. It's not just a bucket that you dump all your water into. So there's a couple of things to think about here. Your site may not be a good site for ponds in general. If you look around the properties around you and you don't see a lot of ponds, there's a good indicator there. Um, because you may not have an, enough natural clay in your soil to uh, to adequately dam your water. And that's a really key thing with ponds. Ponds are not about digging a hole. They're about building up a dam that holds water back in the landscape. That's really what a pond, in, in Australia, they actually call them dams, and that's a much better word than a pond. Um, so it's usually not a crater in the in the ground. You know, it's, it's something like the, the picture above there. And what we have to keep in mind is that there's always a permeable layer. Um, of water that's uh, of, of soil that's going to be saturated underneath the pond and there's that impermeable layer and ideally we have enough clay where we can compact that bottom impermeable layer where we have something that's going to hold water and then we have enough clay to ideally make the entire berm out of clay but if not we make either what's called a key or in the diagram here it's a clay core or you coat the upper slope of where the water is with clay. You can kind of use your clay if you if you find it. But if you don't have enough clay naturally, whether that's spread out throughout your soil or you find a bank in the soil, um, it may not be a good spot for a pond unless you want to get into things like liners or very expensive clay um, additives and things like that. So consider your clay content and really think about that hard if before you invest in a pond. Um, you got to put it in the right place in the site, and the placement is mostly about ha harvesting enough water over time so that the pond stays full. So I've seen a ton of ponds that are put next to the house or um, next to the driveway or where we thought we wanted to take a swim versus really siting them within the hydrology of the landscape so you can harvest enough water. And one key thing there is to understand the concept of runoff coefficient. So this chart here, you don't have to dig into it too deep, but Different materials have different amounts of water they absorb, and then once the, they're saturated, they'll run off, right? So a roof or a, a roadway generally has a 100% runoff rate versus something like a, a thick forest with a healthy soil layer may only have a 10% runoff rate. It takes a lot of water to saturate that soil before it's willing to, to run off. And so you can actually look at the, we can actually calculate in a mapping system, we can look at the, we can calculate the whole watershed draining into that pond. We can say, well, 20% of it is this runoff coefficient and 10% is this and 50% is this, and actually get a sense of how many gallons of water we can expect to come consistently through the site and to fill the pond. Um, one thing we learned with this pond I, I have on the diagram here is that in the beginning, plenty of water to feed this both from the roof from our house like I showed you you can see the greenhouse in the back there we were harvesting that water and, and filtering it uh, flowing it into the pond we had runoff from the pasture it was it was filling beautifully but because we built up so much organic matter in the soil and because we've um, 
increased the vegetation as we've planted our silva pastures and things, we've actually had a harder time because the water is, there's more and more capacity of the land to hold. So keep in mind, if you dig a pond and you increase the water holding capacity of all that upslope land, that's a great problem to have, but you may not keep that pond as full. So we're now um, sourcing water from the larger pond sometimes to siphon and fill up this pond to keep it at a level. And we also accept that it's gonna drop, especially in dry years. So I really recommend a great resource. If you wanna dig into ponds, you really gotta do your homework, learn from others, talk to folks around you that dig ponds and, and what their experience is. Um, a really great resource is what's called the Regrarians um, platform. It's actually a book that talks a lot about farm planning um, on a landscape scale from a lot of different perspectives, but in particular, the water chapter is really well done. Talks about all the mechanics of all the different sources of and sinks of water and, and some really good thinking about you know considerations for those. And I really recommend that as a resource and you can download it online. Um, there's a cost for it, but um, very well worth it. So, so here this picture is just showing, you know, depending on where you are in the landscape, there's different types of dams. Some of these are more expensive or less expensive for the amount of water. And you can see the higher in the landscape you have, the more you can do with that water. If you wanted to irrigate your pastures or water your animals, you would need a higher dam versus these lower dams that may not have as much functionality. So um, thinking through and understanding some of those nuances is really important. A pond is not just a pond, it's a very specific pond in a specific place. Before we dug our pond, we did a test hole. We really looked to make sure that there was enough clay content, watched it for a bit uh, before we decided to go further, and that can be really useful. So if you have a piece of machinery and you're thinking about putting a pond, if you have it on the site, it might be worth digging a test hole. Um, although I will say, beware that the, <laughs> the test hole could also become uh, a dangerous thing. So we lost one of our ducks one night and we found her in this test hole and she couldn't get out. <laughs> so we heard this quacking and we couldn't figure out where it was coming from until we realized that's where she probably was. And then prior to your ponds, you know, it's important to make sure the water coming in is not um, causing problems. Here's that large pond on our site where we have a lot of silt running into the, the pond potentially and, um, and have created some kind of check dams here. And this was originally what we did. It's all planted up in willow now and does a pretty good job of holding stuff back. And we've realized over time we've had to just do this all the way up the watershed essentially. And I'll, I'll talk about that to sort of wrap things up. Um, so this is the bottom. This is the sink. This is a two acre pond, beautiful swimming pond, great for wildlife, lovely feature on the landscape, but it's been silted in for years as the whole south end of it has a lot of silt and it's because no one has done any work with the hydrology upslope until we started working on it. And so during large rain events, all that would just flow right into the pond and it's expensive if not impossible once that's in there to get it out. So what are the ways that we can <clears throat> slow down water, harvest it, and really preserve what is a really valuable resource in this large pond? I'm going to skip a couple slides here. Um, we focus to do that work um, on this concept of a riparian zone. Uh, and this is one diagram. There's a lot of different um, uh, designs for riparian. The, the key thing here is to understand there's kind of different zones to focus on and, and different plants, planting types, and planting structures. So the, the stuff that's going to have potentially water on its feet all the time versus part of the time versus be potentially in the flood zone, right? These are all kind of parts of it. But when we looked at this pond, what we wanted to do was, was develop a riparian corridor that was also productive for the farm. So it had multiple benefits in multiple ways. It could um, not just support the sort of unsilting or, or reduce, reducing the silting of the pond, but also be a benefit for our farm overall. So we were looking at things like elderberry and aronia as crops. Those are berries that you can harvest and make a really delicious kind of um, extract from, like a juice. It's very medicinal, uh, very good for your immune system, um, and um, and pretty easy to make as well, and actually a pretty pretty high demand product. So it worked, worked really well for us. Um, we sort of are still at the, produced for family and friends stage, but um, have, have, have thought about if we want to sell those things and no other farmers around us that sell elderberry and aronia. Um, our riparian zone, we did want to design it so that it was somewhat grazable. And what I want to emphasize is that it's only grazable when the, there is not a super wet time of year or a super wet season. So that could be no times a year, it could be one time a year, maybe two times a year, but we want to be really sensitive to this area. Um, but it is kind of a corridor that we see as a way to connect our animals from our lower pastures up into our sort of upper silvo pasture areas. And then we wanted to plant a diversity of other species that not only had some uses for us, but also for other wildlife. 
we <clears throat> had some background and some understanding of how um, stream beds work. And this is kind of an extreme version here, but this kind of pattern where streams move over time and they, they carve out through erosion uh, edges of the bank and they deposit it sort of as they turn. Um, that's a really important principle to understand. And I think what's important to understand is that um, this is a natural form and, and, and what, what causes the, the, the creek to turn, so to speak, is when, the, when a tree falls down, um, when uh, material piles up enough so now the water has to move around that material, um, when something gets silted in and then the water finds a, an easier way to go. So a natural process, but you, know, you never want to have your water just flowing in a straight line and you always want to account for a buffer that is wide enough to allow the stream to move over the next several decades or, or centuries, ideally, right? So it's not as narrow as you think. It's not just the, the straight shot down and, and it's going to change over time. It's going to be dynamic. And I really recommend spending time actually walking through areas that you see this and looking at the patterns and thinking about how that could apply to your own landscape. So here's that pond at the bottom, the large pond and sort of the, the area that we want to develop and are still developing as a riparian area over time. Um, there's also kind of other ways you can play with. There's these different fun terms like these little wetland areas, the splays or the oxbows are different ways that water can shoot off and, um, and collect. And these are good strategies also, again, to think about um, for when there might be extreme events and things like that. So it's fun to, I think it's fun to read up on this stuff and think about it as really ways to play with water. And, and for me, this is something kind of like what I did when I was a kid, right? Playing in the creek, moving the rocks and mud around. Um, we're all kind of innately, we have this ability in us to just with water and think about it. I you to approach it for, with that perspective. This area was very heavily vegetated with a lot of sort of um, overgrown and somewhat invasive brush. Uh, we cleared that um, both with the chainsaw and with the excavator and, and had to kind of find out where the water was because it was sort of buried underneath this. And so um, cleared that space, um, again, used excavator to dig out. And we were doing a lot of different types of settling ponds, you know, wide and deep, thin and narrow. Again, kind of different um, meandering patterns, ways that could that the water could spill over if it was a, an excessive flow, so that it wasn't overwhelming the original flow that we had, and just kind of playing with the space. And it ends up being about 50 or 60 feet or so across this whole kind of buffer area. So you can see here, you know, up up at the top here, kind of a smaller settling area that is is coming from a ditch. This is overflowing into a larger harvesting uh, area that that was probably four or five feet deep. We intentionally designed this so that we could drive an excavator by it and scoop the silt out. Um, you can see already that this this uh, this creek took a mind of its own, and instead of just going straight down like we thought, it actually meandered through the trees and around and, and found another way in. <laughs> right. So again, we like we set up our own plan and then we let it do its thing as well. We give it the space to do that. And then here's some of the plantings we did. Um, in this case, is mostly elderberry and aronia plantings um, on the creek edge, and it's probably some willow there in the water. Um, and we've since expanded a lot of that stuff along the creek. So we kind of just like stick stuff in as we go. And different species have different desires in terms of how close to the water. So we kind of listed out the trees that we wanted to grow. We thought about where they where they existed. Did they want to be a bank species or sort of within the floodplain that could potentially become saturated or very wet during those extreme events? And then the trees that wanted to be more on the upland or slightly drier, you know, edge of the riparian zone. So these are some of the ones we came up with. And you know, we've planted a lot of alder, and alder has a lot of great properties for wildlife and also potentially could be some future mushroom logs for us. Um, this is red alder, which makes great shiitake bolts, for instance. Um, poplars that we've planted, hybrid poplars, can grow incredibly fast. They're amazing to watch. And mushrooms to grow. Hey, Steve, your audio is kind of... Um going in and out Looked at of selling it as, as we do for maple syrup which is pretty good and that's um basically it to give you a sense of how we've done water on the landscape and um before we do some questions um i'll just give you my contact info here uh we do a lot of education we used to do a water course on the site but that has not happened now in a few years we may do it again if you're in the relative area. Um, we're also looking at, we have a silva pasture class we do online and we're thinking about for the fall or winter doing a water management class. So if you're interested in any of those future opportunities, we have a sign up for our mailing list on our website. Um, and we also do consulting if you wanna have help with some individual um, 
water related or other related things on your site. And I, what I'd say is that each context and each site is very different. And so while these, these principles and the approaches are very universal, it takes a lot of thinking about how it, how it shows up as very unique on your site to, to do it successfully. So uh, yeah, hopefully this helped uh, get you started and some of the resources can help you continue, uh, continue on your journey. Thank you, Steve. I am going to, I'm going to go back over to my slides just so I can, you can get back into the you can stop screen sharing and you can actually see the, the questions that have come in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so one moment. Um, and actually, there was a question I'll ask you right now. Um, uh, would I be able to get a copy of your slides? Uh, there's a couple people that asked for it um, that couldn't quite... Um, some of the visual <laughs> lag, you know, made it hard for them to see the, the slides. So I was wondering if that would be something I could get from you to um, share with yeah. others. Um, yep, I can send you like a PDF, sure. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, awesome. Okay, so, um, you know, I know it's almost almost the top of the hour again. And Steve said that five or ten minutes would be okay um, if folks want to stick around for some questions. Um, so let's see. Going back up to the top, um, someone's asking if you could speak um, to the specifics of using willows for biomass at all. That was something way towards the beginning of the presentation, but. Um, which wasn't really specific to necessarily um, water systems, but if you had any insight into that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, as I used an example, like Will is probably one of our favorite species to work with in, and, and mostly it's because you can start the trees from a, you know, one cutting, one stick can make a tree. And um, we find a lot of willow when growing naturally on the property. It's a very easy thing for us actually at this time of year to go and harvest and then cut up into stakes and then either start those in a bed or in pots or just put them onto the site if we are doing a, a project that it fits into. So it's a very easy way to propagate lots of trees. And, um, you know, you can stick willow right into areas that, that water is flowing and once they're established, they can handle um, just an incredible amount of um, sort of impact. They're they're really designed for for water systems. So I think it's a great tree um, from a water perspective. I think it's great, as I mentioned, from a tree fodder perspective. Very cheap and easy to establish, um, and and really aesthetically pleasing. Very important also for for wildlife, birds, and, and many bird species, and particularly native pollinators. It's one of the earliest sources of pollens in the landscape. So It'll, it'll be the first kind of food available for everybody. So um, I think for all those reasons, it's a really good one to, to play with. And then we've Cornell has been involved with a biomass project. I mean, there's lots of ways to harvest and, and utilize the material as well. So I think it's great to, to just get it around the farm as much as possible, really. Great. Uh, there were some questions um, about your past webinars, and I will be sending around a link that has all the recordings to, um, we've actually had four other webinars by Steve, so um, I'll make sure folks have that in hand uh, in my follow-up email. Question, is there a way to harvest rainwater to create livestock watering catchment systems, for example, for poultry in particular? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm a fan of, um, the, the sort of trailer thing I mentioned, which is you can just fill up the trailer and then move it to the animals. I've also seen um, plenty of examples of um, if your shelter, like uh, we have a duck house that we move around. It's like a eight by 10 um, trailer and um, we could be harvesting rainwater right off of that onto into a tank on the back of the trailer. Um, you know, for instance, and then and then giving that to the ducks. So I've seen designs for that. Um, our uh, we have like we put our duck house on a snowmobile trailer, which is not very <laughs> like it has one set of wheels in the middle, so it's very tippy. So I wouldn't want to put like a bunch of water on the back as well. But if I was using like more like a, a dual axle, you know, like a old hay wagon or something with a bit more strength, I think if you're moving that around, just think about can I harvest it off the roof and integrate that, and then you're good to you're good to go. Excellent. Okay. 
Uh, question, is there a calculation for how wide and how deep to make a swale? Do different factors change how much capacity you should design for? Absolutely. And um, I believe on Brad's site, the rainwaterharvesting.com, I think he has the calculation sheets maybe available as PDFs. I'm not positive. I haven't been there in a little bit, but definitely in his books, he goes through those calculations. And again, it sort of helps you figure out the the width and depth of your basin and the size of your berm. And um, you size that again, based off of what um, surface area you're trying to harvest. And so the vault the sort of square footage of that. And then that runoff coefficient, you know, gives you an assumption of how much is going to run off versus soak in. And I would say that all these calculations, it's very similar if you're familiar with like pasture um, calculations, figuring out how much dry matter you have in pasture. It's a ballpark kind of estimate. It gives you a good range to work with. And then of course, everything changes from day to day and year to year. So, um, but we found those really helpful in, in designing the swales that we did on our farm. So I'd, I'd point you to that for the, for the math. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, question about what was the book called again? I think that was the Regrarian, perhaps. Yeah, they called it the Regrarians platform. Um, I think it's just regrarians.org. It's Darren Doherty, who's a designer out of Australia. Awesome, okay. So I have two more or two more uh, folks ask questions. We'll um, leave those as the final ones. From um, Julie, she said, you've talked about surface water measures, but what about a high water table? So the, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And I, <laughs> I talked about sort of one element of water, which is we could talk about the underground pieces. We could talk about, again, all this sort of um, trinkets and fixtures and plumbing that, that happen on the farm as well. But um, you know, what I'd say with a high water table is uh, it really depends. I don't, you have to look at the dynamics of that and how it, um, how stable it is and how much it changes over time. And I think that um, we have areas of the farm where the water table stays, stays pretty high in most years, except for those extremely dry years. Um, swales become a really great way to work with a high water table um, because you're actually potentially harvesting some subsurface water as well as surface runoff. And, and um, but that all depends again on how deep you're going and things like that. So, um, and it gets back, I guess, also to a question of, um, you know, how high the water table is and how persistent because you might need to in, install some of those, those draining features, right? So that's why drain tile has existed and I'm not opposed to drain tile. I think it's been, I think it's been excessively used in many cases and sort of the only solution for, for creating balance. And I don't think it actually creates balance. I think it, it can dry out pastures as much as it can, can drain them. So this is a good example of where it's a real case by case scenario. What I usually do with folks is look at um, both sort of the historical records on, on water table height, you know, what's, what's said. And then um, we try to dig test holes and really look at the site and kind of get a sense of what's going on and make some plans from there. But, um, if it's really persistent, you may need to think about some other mechanisms for drainage. But um, again, over time, we found some of our areas that we thought had a high water table, um, improved grazing, improving the organic matter, also improves drainage. Um, and so that can be a factor. Excellent. So one last question for now We're from Victoria. She's wondering if you have any insights into working with beaver. They have a beaver family. Um, they like to work with, but they're building dams into pastures, taking over a lot of acreage, tearing down hedgerows. Is that something that you've um, encountered? Yeah, um, we don't have beaver on the farm yet. I um, there's a really cool book called Eager Beaver, <laughs> Eager Beaver, <laughs> um, that Chelsea Green put out a few years ago. That um, I think is a great read because it. It really talks about all the different functions and history of beaver. Like it's a really important animal in the larger landscape. And I, I get on the farm scale, it can be very frustrating. There are um, there are specific tools and mechanisms to support beaver, like building dams, but allowing those dams to, um, to still drain because that can be an issue with flooding. Um, I don't remember the name of them off the top of my head. If you get in touch, I can help connect you. But my brother-in-law is up in Vermont and they're installing both they're trying out both ones that they kind of make themselves and also ones that are on the market that are basically allow a dam to exist, but still drain water. So they have a bit of control. Um, 
But I think if it's a, it's a bit of a dynamic relationship to decide what level of intervention you want to do, what to, how much do you want to let the beavers do their thing, and how much do you want to um, steer that a bit. Um, you know, another example for us was at a nature center I used to work at. We we would spend a lot of time fencing trees that we didn't want the beavers to cut. <laughs> um, and in that way, we kind of were engaging them in forestry in a weird way because they're actually selecting – the smaller suppressed trees in the canopy that we we decided it was fine for them to take and leaving some of the larger ones and um, it was interesting to see that how that shifted the landscape over i mean i was just there for a few years but um so those are other ways so i think it's like a question of balance of how much you want to intervene and how much you want to let them be and um, that's going to really be, depend on how much it really impacts your your site at the end of the day um you know if 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 they're causing that that negative impact so um yeah hopefully that's helpful it's one of those endless, endless questions and very context specific. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, let me just say, Kelly, we'll get you some information about tree fodder. I'm sure we can get that to you. Um, and I think right now I am just going to wrap up before we sign off. I do have just a couple things I want to bring to folks' attention. A reminder that um, a, a short survey will pop up on your screen immediately after we close out. So if you could take a minute to fill that out. We'd really appreciate it. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email with a copy of the recording and slides and um, some other resources uh, in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for that. And then I just want to give a quick plug to some of the other things that we have going on this spring. We have just newly announced a new series of webinars with Dr. Fred Provenza that's starting next week. Should be really, really good. Um, so I'll send out links to those registration forms. Um, and we also have scholarships that we offer on an ongoing basis and handouts that can be personalized and customized with farm photos um, available as well. So I'll include links to that as well in my in my email coming to you in the morning. Um, but I think that's all the time we have today. So I'd like to thank you, Steve, again, for a really great presentation. It's always an honor and a pleasure to host you and share your wealth of information with our with our great folks in the audience. Um, thanks to everyone out there in the audience for sticking around and spending your, your afternoon with us. Um, you know, we'll be in touch soon and hopefully we'll, we'll stay connected. So have a great rest of your afternoon and Monday and take care. Bye-bye, everyone.